My name is Don Hawk of Aidenvelt. Uh, I am going on 10 years of fighting experience on the rapier field, approximately five on the cut and thrust field. Uh, I am both a war fighter and a tournament fighter. Uh, I try to spend as much time practicing and training as I can each week. Obviously, quarantine's been a little bit difficult for that, but hopefully you guys can learn some things today about a certain style of fighting that I appreciate more than most others. And maybe you'll even come away with some tools at home that will help you to train further. Uh, to begin, this class is heavily focused on sword and buckler, not rapier and buckler. Um, I will show you some rapier and buckler, but we're gonna focus on sword and buckler. Um, specifically built out of the uh, I-33 tradition or the Walpurgis manuscript. My copy that I learned from is uh, right here, the Kenner second edition. You can find plenty of videos about MSI-33 online. Um, there's a lot of good resources for it because it's become very popular in the HEMA community lately. It's one of their tournament styles is sword and buckler. Um, so if you are also a HEMA crossover person, I hope that you can get some, some techniques out of this that will step your fighting up to the next plateau. To begin with, uh, what is going to be this, the focus of this does require everyone to have a basic knowledge of some key rapier and fencing terms, mainly like range and tempo and the center. I figure if you're here at this lesson, this isn't your first rapier class. So you probably have an understanding of what I mean when I say if you enter range or if I say you're gaining the center, but I'll try and express those ideas as, as accurately as I can as things go. Um, I don't feel the need terribly to go over all the parts of a sword. This is a sword. You all should probably know what it does and what it looks like. This is my personal uh, custom. I put this together from random parts. I call it my apocalypse sword um, because I can do whatever I want with it. I can two hand it and I can use it as an arming sword. For sword and buckler, you do not want to baseball grip your sword. I'm gonna warn you ahead of time. That's gonna work okay in cut and thrust, but in rapier, you are going to grip it too hard. You're gonna lose tip control and you're going to have a bad time of it. Uh, if you're not comfortable with the long sword thumb press that I can show you right here, I recommend you at least do kind of more of a daintier, maybe put the thumb behind the key on to give you tip control. Because if you're doing this, you wanna have your tip control and you wanna have your finesse in the, in the bind. What is a buckler? A buckler is a very small shield. Normally it is held in one hand by a handle, though there are plenty of examples of them that are held with two straps of leather that cross kind of like an X. One, two. This is a $1 pot lid I purchased at a, uh, just a fair. Uh, the pot itself was not for sale. I don't know what happened to that, somebody bought it. Uh, so the guy had a pot lid. I bought it for a dollar. It served as my buckler for my first seven years of fighting. It served as my buckler for my first interactions of cut and thrust. Uh, I still have it. It's still fine. It's functioning. I can use it all I want. It's probably got more use than any other piece of equipment in my kit. But a lot of you are more familiar with this style of buckler. The Cold Steel $20 cheapo get introduced to fighting buckler. It's fantastic. I recommend if you are entering the sport and you haven't gotten a buckler yet, Grab one, again, 20 bucks, basically indestructible. You'll see them on the heavy field too. You'll see them on modus that they make. Uh, I mod mine by doing a wrap around the handle with uh, just cord. It gives you extra grip because otherwise the grip is co that comes with it is slick. Um, so I do recommend you do a little bit of extra work on yours to at least make the grip a little bit better for you to grip. Unlike a normal buckler, it's hard to get your thumb out and press it against the shield if with these. And uh, that's gonna be a common technique you see with people who do buckler is they wanna press their thumb to maintain pivoting control. And this buckler is hard to do that with. So grip. Lastly, I just wanna show you a later period example of a buckler. This is a Tallhofer style buckler. They come also in one that comes with spikes at each of these eight points for kind of grooving and controlling blades. This is an excellent style of buckler. It works for the same techniques you're gonna see here today. It just has the advantage of a little bit more of dagger style point control when it comes to the tip here and the tip at the bottom. So that's kind of the overview of how buckler and sword are gonna work. And now I'm gonna go ahead and scoop back, reposition myself and show you guys the opening techniques and ideas behind uh, MSI 33. 
All right, so to begin with, uh, there are seven opening guards for MSI 33 practitioners. It's important to learn these because you can really throw an opponent off with some of the more interesting ones here. So I will start kind of in a profile so you can see also my feet. I wore a, an orange sock on my right foot, a blue sock on my left foot to hopefully help you catch how my footwork is going. Everything you do with the buckler in MSI is forward. Your buckler is never up against your body. It is always forward. Worst case, you kind of cock your elbow a little bit, but it is in front of you. The further in front of you it is, as you can tell, the more of your body it protects and covers. Look, my arm is now exposed. Not exposed. So there you go. So every technique you do, you're going to have your buckler forward, and we're going to get to why in a second. All right. Technique number one, or rather the first ward, is you tuck your sword under your shield arm. And what that will look like coming on your opponent is the sword is over here. You can even hide it behind the buckler if you so choose. But you may be asking yourself, how, how good is that going to be? Can you even throw shots from that kind of position? And the answer is yes. You can throw more than the shots that you can think of because you're going to be able to rotate your buckler to give yourself whatever angle you need. You can even come up. You can even cut down and bring the buckler back over to cover as you do things. We're going to get to that in a little bit. First guard. You'll notice my right leg is forward because you're crossing your arm over your body. If I left leg forward this, it's going to get awkward. All right. First ward. Second ward, you just switch your feet and you bring the sword up over your right shoulder. Here's what that looks like face on. And from the other side. A lot of attack angles from this guard. You obviously have your overhead strikes, horizontal strikes, your diagonals, but you really want to try to be tricky. You can drop your arm and cut up into an ox style position and keep your arm covered by the buckler still. So two is useful. Two is also comfortable for cut and thrust particularly. I would argue if you're gonna do two for cut and thrust, make sure you got a basket hilt or a glove. You're risking your arm and your hand. <sighs> Next up is guard three. From two, you shift your feet again sword leg forward, and you bring your sword over to the other shoulder. Should look something like this, square on, like this from the side, like this from the side. Just like the underarm guard, you're going to wonder to yourself, how many shots does he have? Still have all of my upward angles. If I tilt the buckler, I can still do cuts along that outside upward angle. Uh, I can bring things forward into a thrust. It all matters on practice. You discover the angles that work for you. Fourth ward is weird. And I'm actually going to drop down so I can show you fourth ward most accurately. Because fourth ward, you stick your sword way up in the air. Buckler forward. The idea for this is you now have a lot of downward control and power in the fight. Again, highly recommend that as a cut and thrust guard. I've used it in rapier though, and I'll show you how later. Four is up behind. Five, I like to call scorpion tail. Do you hold your sword behind you? If I'm doing this right, then you can see my sword. Now I can point it back, I can point it down, I can point it a little bit forward. You can't tell, it's behind me. From here, I can come up, I can come over, I can even swing straight down. Lots of attack avenues from five, but five is risky and baity. So you gotta know your distance Real good for five to work for you. All right. 
The next guard is the guard you're gonna use a lot. Get comfy with this guard. In my humble opinion, this is the best sword and buckler guard you can ever go into. And it's called middle guard. Your sword is forward. Your shield is covering as best it can. If you wanna do even better, you can kind of turn your hand down. Middle guard, I call it, sometimes it's called sixth guard, is, I, I can't begin to describe, guys. That is how you, you enter engagement and how you win the fight. You can start out of range in any of the other guards, and you can trick your opponent, you can have a good time with it. But the minute you close, you're gonna wind up in some form of middle guard. Some way or another, that's where you're gonna be in the middle. All right, last guard's not really a guard. Last guard's more of the conclusion of an action. And it's if you were in middle guard and you thrust and cover your thrust, that's seventh guard. I call this the raving approach to how you fight. If you've ever seen people at raves, they usually have glow sticks on their fingies and they have their wrists together and they're going crazy like this. That is how you kind of want your hands to play with the sword and the buckler, is that you want your wrists protecting that hand by moving your sword and your buckler as one as you're changing your guards because you don't have a knuckle bow, you don't have rings, no basket, this keeps your hand safe. The cross guard does a bit, but this saves your hand. And also the gauntlet you should be wearing. But that's for safety. So, as again, your wrist should almost, while you're guarding, your wrist should almost be locked together as you're covering and changing your angles. And again, it looks kind of like people who are at a rave, going crazy. And that explains how we get the idea that sixth and seventh guard aren't just here, they're also here. Sixth is here, but also here, and here, because you're covering the middle. I said the middle a lot. It's time to explain. I'm gonna bring my wonderful assistant into play here today. This is a 37 inch rapier blade with a Viking style hilt I've attached to it. He is threatening me. If I were to walk forward, I die. I'm a dead man. This is an excellent form of threat. In fact, if I were to put a buckler over here, I'd say that's an excellent six. So I need to deal with that. And I need to deal with it before I even get into his range. Because that's how you create a bind in a fight. Gaining control of the blade is how you win. If they are offering your blade, you gotta gain it. If they're not offering your blade, you have to force them to offer it. So if they're a gunslinger, and we all know our gunslinger fighters, sword down low, probably got their sword forward, they might have an offhand, and they throw the long shot and they retreat or they wait for a tempo to throw that long shot, you gotta force them to throw it and intercept it and that's where the bind comes into play. So let's assume normal fighter, so even Italian, sword forward, engaging me in combat. As I approach, let's say I approach in two. As I approach, I go to six and I close the line. If I were to now continue, the sword will not harm me. It's not always gonna be ideal though, that they just keep their sword on your sword, and that's where the buckler comes in, and it's why your buckler has a boss, and this ridge, this groove, where the boss meets the shield proper, 
That's your fingers, basically. That's how you grab with the buckler. So if I go back, I close the line. As I step in, I want to grab his sword with the groove, either above or below. Doesn't matter which. I want to grab it. I hate these for this. And once I have it, now I can either cut, I can close the thrust, I can disarm him, but I've won. I've sealed the fight. I've, I've won the middle. I created the bind and I controlled it. That leads me to the whole tempo argument. If I close and bind, he has a reaction, doesn't he? Because you know, everyone always gets a tempo response if they're paying attention. His tempo might be to come up and try to engage me above or go low and sweep under my sword. And that's where your feel of the fight, your understanding of the fight comes into play and why you have this here. A lot of times, particularly in SCA Rapier, we have a lot of passive buckler fighters. They put the buckler out, and that's all they do. It just keeps the person a little bit at distance, covers one lane, maybe just covers the shoulder. In sword and buckler, particularly as you get more and more into the cut and thrust scene, your buckler becomes a more active participant like a dagger would. And I'm going to switch to my preferred shield. I'll start in one this time. As I go, I close. And now I cover with the shield. And I can stab up. Whereas I'm covering, I can pull out and stab. I can stab low. This doesn't just guard me. This becomes a means of control for my opponent's sword as soon as it's offered. And that's the trick for a lot of fighters is how do I get it to offer? Does anyone have an idea of how we get, we force an opponent to offer their blade? Uh, changing your guard uh, to something that would allow the, that, uh, that would um, entice them to yes. uh, present their sword. Beautiful. So I'm approaching as a fighter and I'm sitting in this guard, there's a, there's a lane that's open. My right arm is a target. My head's even a target. If I approach you and I don't change this guard by the time we reach measure, odds are I'm gonna die. As Soon as we cross that measure line where your thrust can land, I have not addressed the middle. I've left the lane open. I'm not controlling the fight. As I approach, if I change my guard, now you have to take at least a moment to reassess the angle of your attack. There's a concept in Bolognese school, the four diagonals, the four different diagonals you can throw your own attack from. And the idea is you can only block off so many at a time. So you have to present some as the target. In this case, I'm presenting shoulder and upper diagonals. But if I cross over, I'm blocking those diagonals off. I'm saying, come over to these ones. And I'm leaving myself open for you to approach. But I do it as I enter the range of your strike. Let's assume this is a fully extended thrust. So that if I were to just walk into this range, I'm dead. That means I need to address this thrust before I enter regular range. Because the thrust, remember, that's probably two to three feet, maybe even just one foot. But I have to address that distance by covering the line of that thrust. So as I approach, it's, all, it's very easy if I know that's where he's going to be thrusting. I gain the blade outside of measure, I close and I kill him. But I have to know that's where he's going to thrust. And that's where using the guards to expose the angles comes into play. That's why you have more than one guard. 
Although you could spend the whole fight in six and at least have a decent chance because you're already controlling the middle. I, I Six, I got the middle, but I'm not doing anything about it. Ah, I died. So I have to change my six slightly. I'm still in six. Things changed. All I did was turn my blade. Gain control of it in a slightly different direction. Change the angle. Gain the tip. Without a way for that opponent to address my tip, they die. Just by walking towards them. Now, this is a non-moving target dummy. This is not a person. People are more erratic, and odds are they're going to change and they're going to mutate their attack to suit my defense. Because that's what everybody does. And that's where closing the line into sixth. So as I approach, I enter sixth to close the line, however I need to. It's over here. Great. It's here. Great. It's in the middle. Whatever I have to do. Now my opponent has to react to my control of the middle. Once you control the middle, you control the tempo and the angle of the fight. It's just like any good rapier engagement. When I control the middle, I now control this fight. Unless he does something to gain control back. As long as I know how to counter that, I'm going to close and kill every single time. Sword and Buckler is the same way. It just is a different way of thinking about two different tools and how they interact with one another. This was really the beginning of fencing, was these two. Because this is how you can engage that opponent in a way that gives you the safe control that leaves you alive without armor. You got to remember, if you don't know already, this style of fighting was developed by monks. This was, you know, traveling friars and monks who wanted to keep themselves safe on their journey. We all, you know, romanticize knights, but who's likely to pick on a wealthy monk while they're traveling? Guy who's got armor and a sword. How do you beat that guy? Control the middle of the fight. Close. Get him on the ground. Come out. Or close. Get him on the ground. Disarm him. Walk away. There's more than one way to win a fight. So, that all applies mostly to rapier, right? Everything's straight on. No one's throwing any wild cuts. I mean, no one's throwing any cuts at all, really. Everything we've been doing so far is maybe into an into engagement. The motion of my sword could be considered a cut. So far, nothing. I mean, what happens if I go into sixth and he beats my blade? What do I do? Same thing you do in any normal situation. You'd either let the beat control your weapon back to the angle you want to go. You could cover with the shield down because they've given you power. This style does not work until your hands are cooperating in the bind. And that's why I have the, the drill I have where you take your hands and put them together and you just do circles. Circling the wrists, keep them together. Do it one way, do it another way, do it with your footwork. If you have a long sword, it works really great too because you can literally tie your hands together with the long sword. That's why long sword fighters get along with the system so well. They're used to having their hands cooperating, and doing one thing. He might beat my weapon aside, he might cut to one of my open diagonals. Is this style going to stop that? Is this style going to win against that kind of combat? Yes. Because you're still just controlling the middle and the bind the best way you can. The most common attack in a cut and thrust scenario, really any scenario where a cut's involved, right shoulder up, cut down to the shield side arm of an opponent. Because that's the easiest cut to throw. If you are drunk, you can throw that cut. If you are angry, you can throw that cut. 
it's easy to throw that cut. MSI 33 has a specific ward. Uh, yeah, let's call it a ward. To address that style of attack, and it's probably one you've seen before. If I'm sitting in six, I can do it if I'm sitting in two. But it's to catch their cut like this, covering with the shield to close. So boom, I've already, I've already addressed the most commonly thrown attack against me. What about the other side? Cut coming from that way. Same thing, but I lead with my sword and I can catch it or I can even Try to do this, don't do this. Catch it like this and roll it. No, that doesn't work, don't try that. But you can lead with a sword in your strongest part of the cross to arrest that motion, cover with a shield, and now you can control them and kill them in the fight. MSI 33, sword and buckler. Uh, later period German is a guy named Lignitzer. He has some very interesting plays. The idea behind this style of fighting is reactionary by force. You are forcing your opponent to give you an action. And if they've already given you an action, by sticking that sword right out front, perfect. Destroy them. Gain with the sword and the buckler. If they don't react, push with the buckler, kill. If they change the angle, cover with the buckler, kill. If they try to gain control of your blade back, that's where things get really interesting. You have now entered a full bind, and if you're not able to grapple with them because of SCA rules, you still have the same techniques to use your shield to manipulate their sword away and close with your own sword to try and kill them. My student is particularly notorious for, once we enter the bind, pushing forward through me, which, if you've never had that happen to you before, is surprising from someone five feet tall. <laughs> but that is a way to gain control of a bind, especially for someone who's, she's five foot, she's, you know, a girl. I'm, what, six foot and a guy with at least 100 pounds on her. But she can push me around once she has the bind. Once she has the middle and her shield has my sword locked in the crook of that buckler, I'm out. She can take control and kill me. So those of you who are here, hopefully you have some experience with rapier. And you have experience, uh, this, this is specifically going to be targeted to people who have experience with the, with the gunslingers I mentioned before. Um, hopefully we all know what I mean by that. But it's the hip fighters that throw just one fast spear thrust to your chest or maybe to your throat or your head. They have that one shot that they've trained and they're naturally very quick, and they understand tempo enough that they'll catch you in the middle of a maybe a step or even just a shift of your guard. They're notorious for it. And they're good fighters. I don't have, like, you know, that's the way you fight. Great, that's the way you fight. But it opens them up to baiting. And it's where your understanding of range and your understanding of the, the concept of seizing the middle comes into play. If I have the middle and I'm covering the shot that they always throw, what are they gonna do? Maybe they'll throw for my leg. Maybe they'll throw for an arm. But I've thrown them off their normal game. And if they don't have a backup shot, then you control the middle and you win. You close as soon as they throw anything that they're, that's different from their normal shot. You just close, cover with the sword, push the shield, stab, cut, swing, do what you need to do. It all just boils down to how well you control the middle. I teach this concept to a lot of heavy fighters too, um, or at least the ones that I interact with up here, um, because they want to fight sword and buckler with rattan. And they want to know, well, how can I, what can I, do I keep my cross guard? Do I keep, and I go, well, to, how do you want to fight? Do you want to do you want to fight the same way you're fighting? Pick up your big shield and fight the way you want to fight. You want to fight Zorn Buckler? Okay, well, we need to talk about controlling your opponent's weapon because they're going to throw right where you're not guarding, and that's your you know your your leg three, 
that's going to be your six on the other side, maybe your five if you're, because your sword's going to be up here or down here. So you got to know how to control the middle no matter what way you're fighting. I did promise I was going to do a little bit of rapier and buckler. So I have my beautiful Hanway cup hilt. Costs $197. I think you can still get them from Cult of Athena. Um, it's a beautiful length. I think it's about 40 inches. Nice cup hilt, so it's just a little bit out of period, but the way I see it, if you're going to go hand protection, go all, go all or go nothing. Like, come on. Keep your hands safe, people. So, odds are you're not going to be in second in rapier or third or first, but you can use the same concepts with your point on the enemy. So instead of first being like this, first is like this. And now you're baiting that arm, but you're still presenting your threat. And your buckler is still useful to you. Because as you close with the rapier from one, gain on the outside line, close the shield, slide up the sword to kill. Two, is just up here. At your high guard. Close. Hopefully you can get your rapier out of the way. You know, I will admit I've done four before. The high, high, high sword with rapier. You really have to control your cuts, though. I do not recommend it for anyone who's a beginner. But it hides your range when your sword's all the way up in the sky. They don't necessarily know exactly how far you can throw. Five's the same way, but I have seen some people fight five where they actually bring the tip of their sword forward so that it's like this, hidden behind their buckler to throw the shot. I don't like this. I don't like relying on subterfuge. If you're going to rely on subterfuge, pick up a cloak. Or buy a RPG. Sixth is still very much here, but we're starting to get into Bolognese school for how sixth works. Because you don't have to cover your hand with the buckler. The buckler can be its own separate entity, and your sword now has a range of guards that it can sit comfortably in without fear. Because if you have the right guard, my arm should disappear. There it is. And now you have to close to kill me. You can't just snipe my arm away, like so many people love to do. It follows the same concept that built out of MSI 33, which is that control of the center gives you control of the opponent, gives you control of the fight. It's, it's grappling without grappling your opponent is a good way to think of it. Because the closest thing you can get to grappling the opponent is to control their sword. Once you control their sword, I mean, best case for them is they run away fast enough to hit the edge of the field i've had that happen before that's i personally don't think that's embarrassing for me i think that's embarrassing for the person running i mean if your only way to get away from me is to run faster than me that's not really fencing anymore that's a that's a that's an athlete that's a like no that's a marathon which yeah you're gonna win <clears throat> so anyway <clears throat> Now you're also going to ask yourself, well, okay, well, you've got this buckler. It's, it's beefy. You've got your big Paul Hoffer buckler. What the hell good is this little pot lid going to be for you? Well, the buckler's not protecting an area of your body. An MSI 33. It's protecting your hand both your hands if you're doing it right. So the size of the buckler is less important as the technique that you are utilizing with it. 
I have used this buckler in cut and thrust tournaments to success. I have used it in rapier tournaments to success. I have uh, lost plenty of times using this buckler because the fighter was better or it was their day. But the point is I can cover both hands just as well as I can with the bigger bucklers. This buckler loses out because it has no boss. I can't control my opponent's weapon as, as well. And I lose out a bit on that. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. This is, this is probably my favorite thing I've learned over time. Not every one of these techniques is gonna work in an SCA context because of the tools we are using. And the best example I can give you is that this weapon is not sharp. It's not sharp at all. At least I hope so. No, it's not sharp. This is not sharp. There is no bite to this weapon. If I throw this weapon at my opponent's sword, it will not stick. It will slide. Which is why, as I was showing you, every interaction with my dummy, I slid down to the cross guard every single time. That's the strong point. That's the crux of the sword. It's where my hand is. That's where I can control everything from. Real swords are sharp. And in the techniques that we see when they bind, sometimes the bind is in the middle of the blades because when sharp hits sharp, they bite each other. And they want to stick. It's the same with the bucklers. Do you ever wonder why in period we, we hear about bucklers made out of wood and leather and not every buckler is made out of metal? It's because it was a perfectly viable strategy to let your opponent chop down into your buckler and then you just turn now that you've got their blade bit into it. I've seen it done in a, in a sharp sparring session. It was fantastic. The guy specifically turned his buckler inside like this, let the guy chop down, and he caught it right here on top, turned the buckler out, and now he has full control of the fight. Guy had nothing. So not every one of these techniques can work because of the physics involved. And that's why having a big, nice boss on your buckler is a good idea. This is, I mean, this is my favorite way to fight. I think I, if I could fight this, this style every day, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to personally thank everyone who attended the, uh, the lesson today. You didn't have to be here. So thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you for, uh, for the wonderful class. We appreciate it. Sure.